Good morning, everyone. If you would stand and join us as we worship. Psalms 146, 1 through 2 says, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace of my troubles. Oh, oh, you are the peace of my troubles. In the silence, you won't let go. In the questions, your truth will hold. Your great love will lead. 
37, 5 through 7 says, Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous rewards shine like the dawn, your vindiction like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him.
you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Maybe the chaos isn't new. Endless war, expanding threats, devastating illness, all of it terrifying, all of it piling up. But one thing has changed. It's never been easier to take it all in, to see the chaos unfold in real time while only barely being touched by it. It's never been more possible to be of the world without really being in it. Will those of us who worship Christ stand at the water's edge, wishing for the lost to be warmed and fed? Or will we spend our lives in worship by becoming the living sacrifices who stop hoping the chaos won't reach us and start carrying the hope of the gospel to those already drowning. Maybe it's time to go. Time in our life when we were trying to write the narrative that is, until the grace of God found us. And now that story is no longer ours to write. That narrative should have changed the moment we accepted the grace of God. I want us to reflect on that moment, though. I want us to remember the first time we felt the grace of Christ. I want us to remember that moment, that time where we made the decision to make Christ our Lord and Savior. To, con to conclude, what was your story? Was it a story of selfishness, of pride and arrogance, one of addiction, one of immorality? What is your story today? Is it a story of selflessness, of service and love, one of showing grace and compassion, one of showing forgiveness even when it's hard to do? The table in the back says, do this in remembrance of me. So let us remember what Christ has done for us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we 
we are thankful for Jesus. We are thankful for the grace that you've shown us. Lord, we pray that we can go out and be a light in this world. Lord, we ask this in your son's name. Amen. As we come to this time of prayer, you can turn on any TV, you can turn on, get on any social media outlet, and you can see that this world is just full of chaos. And I think it's hard sometimes for us to remember that we have an anchor in the Lord, that even through all the distractions, He is there for us. So as we come to this time of prayer, let us, let us remember that, and that's what I'm going to pray about. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we know you are there for us. We know that in the midst of the storm, in the midst of all the chaos, you are our anchor and that we can turn to you, and Lord, that you are our lighthouse, and you will guide us through the midst of the storm. So Lord, I pray as we go about this week that no matter what comes up in our daily lives, that we can remember that you have us in your arms. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11 this morning. If you have a Bible, I'd like you to turn there. We're going to or if you have a phone or whatever, you need to get there. Hebrews 11. I'm going to read a little bit of that chapter. We're talking about faith. We talked last week about how vital faith is to us. And everybody that without faith, you can't please God. You have to have it. How important it is. We also talked about the fact that faith is pretty fragile. You've all seen people. We've seen people who had faith and it seemed to lose faith. And you wonder, well, how, did, how did that happen? What, what went on? Here's the problem. When you base your faith on circumstances, on how God relates to you today and how you can get God to cooperate with you. You're going to have good days and bad days, and some days you're going to go, you know what? <clears throat> Think things are working out just like I hoped they would. Anybody got that going on? Life, life is peachy, and you're going, yay, God, yeah. But life also gets rough, and those days you go, God, what's going on? Where are you? When the bottom drops out, drops out you're going to be tempted to say, God, are you there? Is there even a God? Now, how many of you have experienced all of those? Yay, God, are you there? And are you there? Is there even really a God? Sure, that's, that's normal. That's what happens when you base your faith on circumstances. And last week's sermon, here's the recap on it. The only solid foundation for faith is... Boy, I'm looking for a little more than that. <laughs> the only solid foundation for faith is... Oh, oh come on now. How many of you weren't out here last week? I'll give you a pass. Anybody? Okay, sure. Uh, but you watched online? Okay. The only solid foundation for faith is Jesus and what he has done for me in the past. Okay? That, that's the rock-solid foundation that's never going to change. That's the foundation for faith. And if it's just circumstances, you're going to have trouble all the time. This faith means that no matter what happens tomorrow morning, I can wake up with solid belief, even if things are bad, even if it doesn't work out like I think it should, even if I pray and God doesn't give me what I want him to give me, I still have this confidence that God is on the throne and that his promises are true and he's going to take care of me. The sad truth is most of us would like to have a manageable God. Now, now actually, we don't want a manageable God. We think we want a manageable God. Okay, And what I mean by that is we, we like a God. This is why idols have always been popular. A God that I can take with me that I can call on will do what I need to have done at the right time, but really won't interfere too much with the other parts of my life. For instance, you want God in your life, 
But when you go on spring break, maybe I don't want God right there. Or when you go on a business trip, you know, I, I want him there for part of the business trip because I'd like to make the deal. But for other parts of the business trip, maybe I don't want God there. Or <clears throat> now the fact is, you do want God with you. And, and God is not manageable. If you think faith is going to make God manageable, you, you've missed the whole idea. Don't miss this. God does not cooperate with you. It's not about that. He, he's God. And, and I'm going to try to cooperate with him because he's God. And I'm not ever going to... What people think they want is God to show up and do what they want when they want, which really means they want to be God. And... and wouldn't that be terrible for everybody? So faith is, is different than that. We're, two questions about faith we're going to answer today. I tried to answer at least. One is, what is faith? It's an important question. And the second question is this. What has God promised to give those who have faith? First question, what is faith? Let me just give you a couple things that it's not. First of all, faith is not a power. It's not a force that you tap into by which you control God. It, it doesn't work that way at all. It, I hear people say things like, we're going to speak things into existence. And that really is faith in faith. It's not really faith in God. Faith is not an outside power that if you have, then, then God will do what you want. Faith also is not a formula. It's not like if you pray and then read your Bible and then attend church enough and are nice enough people and sweet to everybody, then maybe God, faith, faith is not a formula like that. I got on my chair at home, I have a Rubik's Cube. It's messed up. But it will not be messed up at the end of the day. Okay, here's why. Because my boys are coming over. Luke and Clayton, and they can both solve Rubik's Cubes because they're geniuses. <laughs> nope, that's not why they can solve it. They can solve it because they went on the internet and they memorized the algorithm to solve Rubik's Cube. And they can do it in a very few seconds. They're not exceptional. Is not because they're exceptionally bright. <laughs> you, you, run that back. Which was, it's not because they're exceptionally bright. It's because they figured out the formula. Listen, there, there's no faith formula that says you do this, this, and this, then, then God's going to give you exactly what you want. You've you got the, the real faith that counts. So it's not, a, it's not a force. It's not a formula. And faith also is not confidence. We, we talk like, you know, we use faith and belief in place of confidence sometimes, like, I, I believe my team is going to win today. Okay. By the way, I do believe my team is going to win today. My team has won 15 in a row. I don't think they're ever going to lose again. <laughs> They'll probably cancel Major League Baseball next year because the Cardinals can't be beat. You know, it's just, I, I just believe they're going to win. I, I watched yesterday, they're down 5 nothing. I, that's no problem. They're probably going to win. And they did. And, 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 they, and today, I just I believe they will. But that is not faith. That's more hope. It's confidence. In my team. By the way, I think Aces football probably win next Friday or Saturday whenever they get to play. Probably will. They, I don't know if the other team will score or not. Don't really care. They're probably going to win. Okay, that's just, but, but that's not faith. That's, that's confidence. And faith is not just confidence or hope for the future. So what does it mean when you read faith in the Bible? What, what's he talking about? I'm talking about biblical faith. Well, the book of Hebrews, we looked at last week for just a little bit, was written to Christians who were having a rough time. Things were not working out like they thought they were going to work out. Their lives were rough, even though they were following Jesus Christ. And he gives them this lesson on faith, Hebrews 11, 1, and maybe you memorize this verse. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now, just let that mull through a little bit. Faith is the assurance of things that I've been hoping for, is the conviction of things I have not seen yet. So faith, let me give you this example. Let's just say that I call you on the phone and you don't answer because you're young. <laughs> now I answer the phone because I'm old. And I talk to all kinds of interesting people. I talk to people who think I, my car needs a better warranty. <laughs> I, I, I talk to people who call me because they care about me and they know my social security number has been compromised. I, I talk to the police. Well, not actually the police, but the people raising money for the police. I talk, I talk, and you know, I answer the phone because I'm old. And old people answer the phone. That's what we do. We always did. We used to run, but 
but you're young, you don't answer the phone, so I call you, and you don't answer the phone, and I, I leave a voicemail for you, and I say, hey, on Thursday, I'd like to buy you lunch. I'm going to take you to a restaurant. I named the restaurant. It's expensive, okay? Or we're going to take you to a nice restaurant for lunch. I'm taking you to a nice restaurant on lunch for lunch on Thursday, okay? I leave the voicemail, and then I hang up. What has to happen to me to move from, I hope they come eat lunch with me, to I have faith, I'm sure, they'll show up for lunch. Well, we'll get back to that in just a second. You, you think about that. He gives a couple examples. Verse 2, for by this faith, men of old gained approval. Then he gives some examples beginning in verse 7. Here's the first one, by faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen. Remember that, that verse 1, conviction of things not yet seen? Being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence, he prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world, became an heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. Now, why did Noah build an ark? Do you think Noah watched the news one day and he thought, you know, there, there's mass killings in Collierville, Tennessee, and there's wildfires in the West, and there's this Gabby Patino, and I don't know what happened to her, and I don't know, where's that guy, and is he in the swamp? And, and, and Afghanistan and a, a border crisis. You think Noah looked at all that after watching the news one day and thought, you know what, God? This world's going to hell in a handbasket. Ever thought that? This world's going to hell in a handbasket, and I don't know. God, and, and there's so much of this immorality and so much. God, I think the only solution is for you to send a, a flood and wipe these people out and just start over with me and my family. And God, I am believing you're going to send a flood. And you think that God in heaven thought, you know what, I hadn't thought of that? Well, that's a good idea. And look at the faith this guy has. I mean, I, okay, I'll send a flood. Why did Noah build an ark? Because God warned there's going to be a flood. You better build a boat. It, faith always starts with God. Verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was received for an inheritance. He went out, not knowing where he was going. I'm too old to move. I'm too old to move. Abraham is 75 years old. And God says, I want you to move. And he just, he just up and goes. Hey, Abraham did not go sit around one day and say, God, maybe I can move. No, it was God's idea. He responded to it. Verse 13, all these, Abel, Enoch, Abraham, Noah, Sarah, all these died in faith without receiving the promises, that's key, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on earth. They were counting on God to act as he promised, even though they didn't receive the promises yet. The bridge between hope and faith is the promise of God. Hope is, God, I hope you'll do this. I want, I'd like for you to do this. And faith is, God, I know you'll do this. And the bridge between hope and faith is the promise of God. And so the reason that I can show up at a restaurant on Thursday and expect you to be there, are you coming for lunch? The reason I expect you to be there is because you come back. Now, you know this. People don't listen to voicemails, right? And they don't, and they don't read texts either. They're impossible to get a hold of. And so if I, if I just send you a voicemail and say, I'll meet you at the restaurant, and I show up but you don't ever respond, I do that purely by purely by presumption. I just presume you'll be there. I don't have any faith. But if you call me back and say, yes, at noon I'll be there, then we're acting on, on faith at that point. Hebrews eleven six. here's the definition for faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. He who comes to God must believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Here's Andy Stanley's definition of faith. Faith is confidence that God is who he said he is. And he'll do exactly what he'll said he'll do. That's pretty simple. Would you read that with me? Faith is confidence that God is who he said he is, that he'll do everything he promised to do. God, I believe you are who you say you are. And God says he's the creator. We skip verse 3 of this chapter. God said, I'm the creator of the universe. I believe he's creator. I believe he has power over everything. I, I, don't. I read the Bible. I, I read phenomenal things in the Bible. Miracle things. I'll tell you one. The, what, the day the sun stood still. Read that in the book of Joshua. I, listen, I believe God could do that. 
But you think, well, the world would fall apart. Well, I believe God kept it from falling apart. And anybody else? I believe God is who he said he is. And I also believe, God, that you'll do exactly what you've promised to do. And that's what faith is. Conviction that God is who he said he is. He'll do exactly what he promised to do. So here's the big question of the day then. Well, then what has God promised to do? If I believe he'll do it, what did he promise to do? Well, number one, let me just say this. God did not promise you a trouble-free life. Aren't you glad you came to church today? John 16, 33. Jesus promises in this world, you will have trouble. You're going to have trouble. I'm just... Margot, second week in a row in church with us, two years old, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have trouble. I, I just know. Okay, Everly, you're going to have trouble. It doesn't seem like it right now. Things go on her way. You're going to have trouble. In the back row, with the gray hair, the no hair, you're going to have trouble. Okay? It's promise. And he did not promise you a trouble-free life. Jesus' disciples had the greatest faith and the greatest trouble. You want to have great faith? Well, you're going to have great trouble, too. And they were all martyred because of their faith. God has not promised to make us all wealthy. When the, rich, when the rich young ruler walked away sad but not following Jesus, Jesus said it's hard for rich people to go to heaven. And the disciples said, this doesn't make sense because he has everything, we have nothing. And Jesus said, I'm going to give you what you need. But he did not mean I'm going to give you wealth here. In fact, you read the life stories of the apostles in the book of Acts. You notice this. They had great faith, but they didn't have much money. In fact, part of the reason they have such credibility they were eyewitnesses of the resurrection, said Jesus is alive from the grave. But it didn't profit them financially to say that. Now, most of us are wealthy. Congratulations, rich folks. Enjoy yourselves. That's great. I don't have any problem with that. But God did not promise you wealth, and God did not also promise that he would heal everybody. He heals some, miraculously, but God does not heal everybody. In the book of John, chapter 5, there's a pool at Bethesda there, and Jesus walks up to the pool. Now, they had this idea, and I don't know if it's true or not, but they believed that every once in a while an angel would stir that pool, and the first guy into the pool when the water was stirred would be healed. Now, the problem was all those who were fairly healthy sick people, are you with me? When the water stirred, they got in easily. But the guy who was really sick, when the water stirred, he couldn't get in. So Jesus walks up to a guy. He's been there for a long time, sitting by the pool, waiting for the water to be stirred. And Jesus said, do you want to get well? And he said, uh, you, you know I want to get well. But when somebody else, when it stirred, somebody else gets in first. And I think Jesus doesn't say this. I think Jesus whispers to him, not causing a ruckus, just pick up your mat and let's get out of here. And they walk out, healed, and the rest are still sick. Do you see a problem with that? Jesus didn't promise to heal everybody. He heals some, and when he does, we're so grateful. But he didn't promise to heal everybody. Now, here's the good news. What God has promised is better than what he has not promised. He didn't promise to make you happy. He didn't promise to make you healthy. He didn't promise to make you wealthy or trouble-free. What he has promised is better than what he didn't promise. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16 we started on this passage last week. We'll finish it right now. Hebrews 4, 14. Here's what God promised. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let's hold fast to our confession. He's the solid rock of our faith. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Here's what he promises. Number one, you can come confidently to God. He said, he didn't say come with formality. He said, you come confidently to the throne of grace because you're talking to your daddy. Truthfully, I love it when my kids call me on the phone. I do. I love it when they call me on the phone. And sometimes they call me because they need things. I have one daughter who calls me when her car breaks down. She lives in Texas. I'm not much help, but I'm always glad to talk to her. And, and I do offer things. Uh, last time she called, I, I said, 
why don't you let me ship that car home? Maybe we can get it fixed here. I, 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 and sometimes I can help, sometimes I can't, but I'm always glad she calls. And God says, when you, when you have trouble, you can call on me because I'm your daddy. So anybody got trouble? Then you just ask God. You ask God for anything you want, anything you need, whatever's on your heart. You ask him, and you come confidently to the throne of grace. And then he says, you can also receive mercy when you come. Mercy means he's going to say, you know what, I understand. Remember what he said? We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with us and our weakness, but one who is like us, tempted in all ways as we are. So whatever it is you're going through, you can take it to God and say, God, this is killing me. And Jesus will answer, I know. I know. I, I know what it's like. You know, he knows what it's like to spend the night unable to sleep because of what's going to happen tomorrow morning. You ever had a, a night like that? A night where you couldn't sleep? <clears throat> Maybe you're getting ready to face surgery. Last time I went to surgery, and I hope it is the last time. Last time I went to surgery, they, uh, they got me in there and said, your blood pressure is pretty high. I said, you're going to cut on me. I'm excited about it. I'm not resting easy. Give me the gas. <laughs> then I will rest easy. No. It, the, the night before surgery, did you sleep well? No. Of course not. The night before you went to court? Ah, terrible. The night before the test came back? Jesus knows what that's like. The Bible says he was up that night. He sweat drops of blood. Luke twenty two forty four says in agony, drops of blood falling down from the ground like sweat. Yeah, he knows what that's like. He, he knows what it's like to be betrayed and deserted. He knows what it's like to have those who love you the best to walk out when they should walk in. Some of you know what that's about. You've had a business partner or a marriage partner, somebody just walk out at the wrong time. He knows what that's about. He knows what it's like to be rejected by those who are closest to him. He even knows what it's like to have crushing temptation that comes again and again. Ever had this experience? You pray about temptation. I've been, I've been struggling with this. You pray about it, and it comes again, and you do well. And you're going, yes, that's great. And then when you least suspect it, there's a temptation again. And this time you don't do as well. You know that Jesus was tempted like we are? And Luke 4, I think it's verse 13, says, after the temptations of Christ, that wilderness, says the devil left Jesus until an opportune time. And there was always an opportune time. And, and, and so when you come to Jesus, come to God and say, God, I've, just, I've, so, I've messed up again. I've, I've fallen, and this temptation is crushing me. Jesus says, I know. I understand what that's about. He comes, he receives you with mercy. Here, here's why that's a big deal. Because your problems may not seem like a big deal to somebody else. Sometimes people come to me, I should not tell you the truth about myself. Sometimes people come to me and they, they give me their whole, they lay out their problem. I go, so? I've talked to 12 people today that have worse problems than that. Just buck up. Let's go. You have a third grade problem. <laughs> you all hate me. That's okay. I don't blame you. I, I feel the same way. Wish I had more of that empathy, but, but, but Jesus has it. You come to you, and, and, listen, a high school girl can't get a date for the whatever, or the guy that was going to go with her actually takes somebody else, and Jesus says, oh, I hate it when that happens. I'm going, you'll live through it. But Jesus is way better than that. He, he doesn't say buck up, he receives you with mercy. You can come confidently to the throne of grace. He'll receive you with mercy, and he'll give you grace to help in your time of need. Sometimes grace that helps in the time of need is going to be he's going to change your circumstance. You pray for healing, God gives healing. You pray for this, God, you pray for money, God gives it. Sometimes it's going to be somebody, God's going to bring somebody to walk beside you in the trouble, and that's good. And sometimes nothing will change except God gives his grace, and you walk through the storm, and you're better off than before. Now, I know that's not very emotionally satisfying. Maybe we'd have more fun in church if when I was preaching, the organ would play, and we could ramp up faith a little bit. We'd go, if you have enough faith, let's go. Come on, a little faith, and you can get what you want. But that's not what the Bible teaches about faith. It does say this. Someday you'll get the ultimate intervention, and God will take care of things. Someday he'll wrap all this up, and it'll be okay. So what is faith? 
Faith is believing that God is who he said he is. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? God is who he said he is? And he'll do everything he promised you. You believe that? You know what he promised? He said, you come confidently to me, like to your dad. You can, you'll receive mercy, I'll understand, and I'll give you grace to help in that hour. Now, as a Christian, you can ask for anything you want, and you should, but you don't have to faith God into answering. Faith is confidence. God can do what you need, and even when he says no, it'll be the best thing. I want to close by, I'm going to look at Luke chapter 5. I, I, I gave you a brief snippet of this last week. I was in the ICU waiting room with friends, and my friend was in the hospital, and he was uh, teetering between life and death. And, one, and we were praying, and one of the people there said, I, I'm praying and believing. I just know that God is going to heal him. And I told the man's wife, a friend of mine, I said, I'm praying, and I know God can heal him. I don't have any doubt about that, but I don't know what God's going to do. I would not presume to speak for God. Luke chapter 5. We'll close with this in verse 12. When Jesus was in one of the cities, behold, there was a man covered with leprosy. That's a death sentence. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him. If you're willing, you can make me clean. Not God, not Jesus, I know you're going to make me clean. Just, Jesus, I know who you are. I believe what you've said. And I'm asking you for a favor. And Jesus says, I'm willing. When you ask, sometimes God will say, yeah, let's do that. I'm willing. Those are glory hallelujah days. Those are great days. I was listening to K-Love on the radio Friday with Julie in the car. I like the music, but that mindless chatter between the songs... I can't hardly abide it. Uh, you're learning too much, aren't you? And it was Happy Friday. So we all had Happy Friday stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was, and it was time after time, and it did this, and 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 we were my marriage part just falling apart, and we prayed and prayed and prayed, and God brought it back together. And I thought that's great, but what about those times when God didn't bring it back together? Did they not have faith? Because sometimes God is going to say, you say, God, if you're willing, and it'll say, I am willing, let's do that. And sometimes when you ask for something that seems to be good, God's going to say, not yet. You have to wait a while. That's tough. And sometimes God will say, no. Faith is believing that God is who he said he is, and that even when he says no, he does so out of love, and that's going to be the very best for me. Here's the problem. God is not manageable. He's God. And I'm glad it's so. In the book of Daniel, you know the story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were worshipers of God. They were living in a foreign land, and the king of Nebuchadnezzar set up this idol, this big, tall idol, and said, everybody, when you hear the music, everybody's got to fall down and worship this, this idol. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, there's only one God. We're not serving any other God but the real God. And so they caught them not worshiping the, the idol. And they brought them before the king, and he said, I'm going to give you one more chance. Like a little bunny foo-foo, one more chance. One more chance. I'm going to play the music. You better bow down. And they played the music, and they stood still. The king said, don't you know, if you don't bow down, I'm going to throw you into the fire furnace. There is no God who could save you. And there were, Daniel 3, 17 and 18, their remark is this. The three boys say this. Our God, here's faith, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. He is able. I believe he's able. And our God will deliver us. But even if he does not, he's still the only God there is. And we will serve no other. I don't know what God will say when you pray but I know there's nobody else to pray to. I, I, I believe 
Anybody else believe? I believe he's God Almighty. Sits on the throne of the earth, has all the power at his disposal. He can interrupt the processes of nature. He can do whatever he chooses to do. And I'm going to ask him for what I want. I'm going to boldly ask God, this is what I want. And I'm going to try to have the faith to believe that he's still on the throne when he says yes, and when he says maybe, or later, and when he says no. He's still God. Let me pray for you. God, this teaching, a little contrary to what's being heard a lot of places today. Father, we know this is what your word teaches. And I just like to say for us as a group, we believe you're almighty God on the throne in charge. Father, we come to you today, we, we all have issues going on in our lives, and we're praying, we're asking, we're imploring you. Would you please, Father, give us the faith to ask boldly, to know you can do it, and the faith to know that when you say no, that you're still God, you're still in charge, it's because you love us. Father, we don't see all that yet. One day we will. We look forward to that day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us this morning. I have a few announcements for you. The first being, we have our upcoming Super Wow on October 6th right here at Parkview. Our last one was awesome. There's going to be great food, great worship, great preaching. We hope to see you there on October 6th. Hope Pregnancy and Resource Center's annual banquet is coming up on October 12th at 6 p.m. This event will be held at the Anderson Building in the 4-H Complex. It's a free of charge event, but they would appreciate if you could get reservations for dining in before September 30th. The guest speaker will be Dr. Ron Archer, so please come and support this Parkview supported mission. Lastly, we have our youth group announcements. We will not be having fourth and fifth grade youth group tonight, but we will have junior high at the Legion from 5 to 6.30, and also high school will be at the Legion from 6 to 7.30. We'll be studying Romans 5. It's going to be great, and we hope to see you all next week. Bye!